This morning I want to begin by asking you a question, and I hope you've been thinking about such things. Um, it's the beginning of a new year, and the question I want to ask you is, uh, what do you want to see God do in you or through you this year? If you could sit down and write out the story of how the next year, or if you're one of those planners, the next five years or ten years, how they were going to go, uh, what would you want to see God do uh, in you and through you? And so for you, maybe it's like I could uh, overcome an addiction, or maybe for you, it's that God would restore your marriage or work among your family or, you know, friends, whatever it might be. Um, what would you want to see God do both in you and through you? Uh, today, uh, we're going we're gonna to be talking about the one thing that I believe is more important than any other thing if you're going to see God work both in you and through you. But, uh, y'all, before I get there, I need to make a confession to you as your pastor. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I did something I thought I wouldn't do. I went to the store, and I switched from an Android phone to an iPhone. Now, hold on. If you're one of the faithful Android users, you know, that you endure the persecution and abuse that comes with that, I stand in solidarity with you. Thank you for making the world a better place uh, I, I too, uh, would hold Android to be superior. I am a man of principle, but I'm more of a tightwad than I am an Android lover, and the iPhone was 100 bucks cheaper. So uh, I made the switch to iPhone. Here I stand. I've made my confession to you. Uh, some real benefits that have come out of that, I got re-included in my family group text. And I'm not just talking about, like, my kids. I'm talking about my parents didn't want me in their group text because it messed up their videos. or what. You know what I mean? Um, I had a birthday a couple of weeks ago, and uh, Josh Schneider texted me, hey, happy birthday. I was like, thanks. And within about half a second, he was like, oh, my gosh, you got an iPhone because my messages were now blue or green or whatever uh, color they need to be to be legit or whatever it might be in our society. Uh, there's been a lot of good things that come. As you know, like smartphones, the amount of things that you can do on them these days, you know, it started off when you got your first janky old cell phone. You had like a clock. You could text a few people, make a phone call, and that was about it. And then we got some games. You know, you play the snake game or whatever. But now it's like weather and news, and you can c connect with anyone you want to, friends, family, and via social media, a heck of a lot of people you, you may not even want to connect with, uh, but uh, they can track you down, and so there you are. Uh, phones have really come a long way. You can open your garage door now, you know, just need your phone, or uh, see who's at your front door. You got your ring doorbell. There are people that are constantly monitoring their home security systems. Uh, we were at Christmas this year, and my mother-in-law said, who is that at my front door? And she's like talking to someone. Uh, she was not very kindly talking to them about at their front door. It turns out he was just delivering a package. He wasn't stealing, but... Uh, we can do a lot on our phones. People manage their finances and their calendars. You can stalk your family members, Life360, you know, just about where they, where they are at any given time. Uh, a lot of benefits, but I, I do need to share with you guys one of the, the main drawbacks to converting from Android to iPhone. The, the biggest problem I've encountered so far is that my children and wife also have Apple devices. And the very first day I brought my iPhone home, I found that my charger was already missing. And for all that you can do with a phone, for all of its capabilities, for, you know, all of the technological developments, uh, cell phones are completely, smartphones are completely worthless when not consistently connected to a source of power. And you know, the same is true for you and me. For many of you, God has extraordinary plans for your life, and He wants to work in you. He wants to change your life. He wants to set you free. He wants to heal your marriage and your brokenness. He wants to transform your family, and I believe God wants to transform our community. But we're a whole lot like cell phones, an extraordinary amount of potential. But if we aren't consistently connected to a source of power, we're not good for much of anything. Y'all, this isn't just my words. I'm not just here as a pastor trying to pump you up because it's a new year. Um, 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you back to 2,000 years ago when the words of Jesus Christ, who came in flesh, right, who offered himself for us on the cross that we might find new and abundant life in him. And so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to John chapter 15. We're going to begin in verse 5. Now, in the chapter before, Jesus has been doing something rather interesting. Now, most of us, if we had a choice of having Jesus in the flesh walking among us and not having Jesus, we'd say, we want Jesus, right? I would love to see Jesus, how he would navigate our, our culture, politics, how Jesus would navigate our family get-togethers. Like, it would be really nice to be able to see him with our eyes. And yet, Jesus has just told his disciples that he's going away. And not just that he's going away, but it's ultimately better for them that he does. And of course, the disciples are not excited by this news. They didn't realize that Jesus was going to die on the cross and be raised on the third day for the forgiveness of sins. Like they didn't know all of what Jesus was going to do, but they didn't want to see him go away. But he gives them some really good news uh, about his departure. He said, it's best if I go away because when I go, I'm going to send my Holy Spirit. He's like, you know the things that you've seen me doing? Remember how I preached the good news to the poor? Unlike all the other religious leaders who want to, you know, kind of hang out with the elites and the wealthy and the educated and all that, uh, you know, I went to the poor and I cared for them and how you saw me um, heal the sick. The guy who was born blind, he began to see and the lame man was, was starting to walk. The deaf man could hear. You remember how I raised Lazarus from the dead? He's like, you want to know why it's better that I go? Because I'm going to send my Holy Spirit to live within you. And collectively as my disciples, I'm going to do greater things through you even than you've seen happen through me. The reason that we can celebrate the departure of Jesus, the disciples could look forward to that. And the reason that Jesus could tell us that it was a better thing is, is not because he was done. It's not because he's of his absence. It's because he was going to do even greater things in us and through us than the disciples saw him do in the flesh while he was here. And in John chapter 15, verse 5, he's going to tell us the most important ingredient, the thing that is most essential if we're going to see that happen. And y'all, we live in a time that they, we need to see Jesus at work. I mean, we need to see it in our culture. We need to see it in our schools. We need to see it in our families. And so today I want to talk to you about that most important thing, um, the best investment. I've been asking you over the last couple of weeks um, to invest your life into the kingdom of God and hope for an extraordinary return. That you begin to sow the, the seeds of the pursuit of the kingdom in your life and hope to reap an extraordinary harvest. I believe that the one we're going to talk about today is the single most important thing that you can do to see God work both in you and through you. Now, over the next several weeks, we'll give you some more things to pursue, but I believe this one is most important. Here's what Jesus says in John chapter 15, verse 5. He says, I am the vine. And you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, you don't have to have an agricultural degree or, you know, be someone who works at a vineyard to understand what Jesus is talking about here. I mean, we live in the South, right? We've got a rugged area, lots of trees, and you, know, you may not grow crops, but you get this. That branches that become disconnected from the tree, they don't bear fruit. We don't wander around on the ground looking for branches that are broken off and think, you know, where's the fruit here? We understand that the source of life and growth from, uh, that, that will ultimately produce the fruit comes from the tree and not from the branch itself. So disconnected branches aren't worth much to us. We, we use them as firewood around here, right? I mean, they're not much, there's not much hope in something that's disconnected. But Jesus says this, If you abide in me, and I in you, if you remain connected to me, your life is going to bear much fruit. Now, I don't know what your story is. I don't know, maybe you grew up in church and you know all the, the Bible passages. You might be able to preach this text better than I could. You might have had it memorized. Like you might have the, the religious pedigree. But you know what's true of you? That if you abide in Christ and Him and you, you're going to bear much fruit. But apart from Him, you will do nothing. 
Or maybe your story is the opposite. Man, you weren't raised in church. You don't know all of the scriptures. You're not you know, the most well-versed person. Maybe you're new and you're like, I've never heard this before. Here's what's true of you and your life. If you will abide in Jesus, remain connected to him and he in you, then your life is going to bear much fruit. What you can look forward to, what you can anticipate in your life is much good fruit. God working both in you and God working through you. What we call this process, uh, abiding in Christ, the way that we define it here at Cross Community, we call it devoting daily. And, And what we're trying to say is that there is this ongoing pursuit of a deep and meaningful relationship with Jesus Christ that happens every single day. Now, Jesus has promised he will never leave us or forsake us, but oftentimes we get a bit distracted, don't we? We get busy pursuing the things of this world. We got a job. We got our, our hobbies, dad gum. We got our kids. There's lots going on. And oftentimes we can fail to abide in Christ. And as a result, we don't see God working in us and through us in power. And so what we're calling on our church to do, if you're a covenant member here, what we agree to do together is that we will devote ourselves every single day to Jesus Christ. There's not a day lived without him, but we want to walk with him all throughout our lives. Has anyone here ever had to move back in with their parents? I'm not talking about you come for a visit because it's different when you visit your mom and dad, you know, Um, come in for a day or so. And I mean, your mom probably took really good care of you. When I came home from college, it was, it was pretty nice. She did my laundry. She made food. They would fill up my gas tank for me. You know, I was heading back to Stillwater. It was really nice to visit. But it's a different deal when you move in. Uh, when we actually came back to Poto after I was married, Logan had just been born. He was a little bitty baby. baby and our, our house sold in one day in Van Buren. I was like, ooh, what are we going to do? We don't have another house to move into. And so we moved back in with my parents. And I'll tell you, they are extremely gracious, easygoing people. They were never the problem. But it's hard when you move in, right? It's like you're there all the time. It's like this ongoing thing. And so, you know, there are going to be little tiny tensions, and they were mostly my fault. But it's just a different thing when you live there. Uh, It is very different um, from visiting your family when you, you move in. And I will tell you this, it is very different to abide in Jesus. It's a totally different thing to live your whole life with him. Every step, every day, every moment live with Jesus is profoundly different than connecting with him for a few minutes every morning. Now, my youngest son, Luke, uh, he, he remains convinced. He has an iPad and he likes to play on the iPad. He's going to wear, I mean, the battery's going to get run down. Um, but he likes to do this thing where he'll plug it in for about three minutes and think, all right, I'm ready to go again. And then he's, he's profoundly disappointed when five minutes later it's dead and gone again. And many of us kind of treat our relationship with Jesus that way. We think, well, I'll just connect for a few minutes here and there and it'll carry me through. You know, the only way that we're going to see God working in us and through us, us in any meaningful way is when we we remain consistently connected to Jesus. He is the vine. We're the branch. And it's only when we abide in him and he in us that that life-giving power that transforms us and works through us that that will be received in him. Now, I don't know what this looks like for every person. We talk about devoting ourselves daily to Jesus Christ. And again, it's not uh, 15 minutes in the morning, read the word, put that down, going on to the next thing. But rather, it is walking with Christ throughout our entire day. Here's what I want to tell you. Because this is true, and Jesus said it's true, I believe this is the single most important investment you will ever make with your life. Because abiding in Jesus means you'll bear much fruit, but being apart from him means there will be no fruit in your life. There is not a single greater investment that you will make other than the time that you spend with with Jesus. As a matter of fact, the single greatest gift you will ever give to yourself or your family or your boss or your coworkers or your neighborhood or, or this world, the single greatest gift you will ever give them is the time that you spend with Jesus because that is the time that totally transforms your life. It enables the power of God to work both in you and ultimately through you. What I would say to you, because oftentimes think, people think, oh, it's a new year, I'm going to tweak some things about my life and you know, hopefully see a better outcome. 
I believe that this is so important for you that I would call on you to dramatically reorder your entire life around this one single pursuit. You know what I hear a lot with church people is, yeah, man, I got to get back in the Word. I've really got to start spending more time in prayer. You know, I really need to reconnect with God. I've got to get things going again. And you know what that, that suggests? It suggests a profound misunderstanding of what's truly important and productive in our lives. The single most important thing you will do on any given day is the time that you invest with Jesus, abiding with him, walking through him in each and every single moment. And so once again, I want to invite you to dramatically reorder your life around abiding with Jesus Christ, making your life with him, connected to him at every single moment of every single day. So what does it look like to abide with Christ? I'm not going to give you a comprehensive list, all right? There's lots of things. If you want to start fasting uh, once a week, going without food, you want to like, you know, really go up there on the Christian discipline thing, I encourage you to do that. It will help you abide with Christ, all right? If you want to sell everything you have, give it to the poor, abide with Christ, right? I'm going to give you two things today that I believe will, again, dramatically change your life, allow God uh, to work in you and through you as you remain connected to him. So discipline number one, of devoting daily is this, abiding with Christ in his word. Now, this isn't merely just opening up the Bible and reading a few words on a page, but I mean abiding in his word. So we, we look at the scriptures and we read the scriptures and we do so both to live or to learn and to live out the word of God. And so what it means is as you read the Bible, you seek to live that out in that given day. As you look at the love of Christ, um, you're reminded of how much he loved you, of how much God loved you, that he would offer his son on the cross, that you might have life. And then we're reminded that we've been called to love other people the same. And y'all, that's a year's worth of meditation right there, just thinking on what does it look like for me to love my spouse like that? What does it look like for me to love my friends like that? We meditate on the word. We, we seek to live it out. In, in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus told a parable. And he says, the one who hears these words of mine, in our case, we might listen on, you know, you version, or we might read it in our, our Bible, whatever it looks like for you. But he says, the one who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. is like the man who built his house on the rock man who built a solid foundation. His whole life was built on that solid foundation. And the rains fell, and the winds blew, and the storm raged, and nothing touched that house. It remained, no matter what circumstances he encountered, like that house stood firm. But then there's the other side of that story. And as a person who hears these words of mine, Jesus says, but doesn't put them into practice, might have spent some time, might, might have been able to brag, like made it through the whole Bible in a year. Uh, maybe he'd read it several times. The one who hears these words of mine but doesn't put them into practice, that doesn't actually live out the Word of God, that never takes a step of faith to trust God to actually do what he says to do, is like the guy who built his house on the sand. And when the rains fell, the winds blew, the flood came, that house fell with a great crash. Church, I believe that we're living in more and more difficult days. It is becoming increasingly difficult to live out our faith well in the midst of our culture, and I don't think that's going to get any better. But do you know how we build lives that will ultimately stand? Do you know how we uh, make sure that we're on a solid foundation? And we open up the Word of God and we learn what is true. We learn what is right. We learn what is good. And then we live those things out. And we trust God with the rest. Like It's not always going to be very popular for us to believe and live the Word of God. But to the extent that we do, we can trust that He's going to make our house stand. So number one, we just abide with Christ in His Word every single day. Like when you read it, I encourage you to talk to your spouse about it. Like, hey, here's what I'm reading the Word. And, and listen, don't even feel bad if it's stuff that you don't get. You're like, man, I'm in numbers and I don't understand all these things. these things. That's okay. Be talking about the word with your coworkers. Talk about the parable that you just read. Uh, and whatever it might be, you have these discussions because we want to abide in Christ. We're meditating on his word and what it looks like for us to apply that in our lives. Number one, we abide with Christ in his word. And number two, we abide with Christ in prayer. Now, I, 
I don't know what prayer looks like for you. When I was a kid, uh, I kind of thought prayer was like a language you learned. There was a lot of King James praying when I was a child, you know, like, and, and usually it was like an old guy who would stand up in front of the whole church and he would articulate something and they might've been godly old men. I didn't always understand what they meant because they were speaking in the King's English, right? And so I thought it was like this language to be learned. My parents would break it out. We'd have family prayer and they'd pray for like 14 minutes and my sister and I are, you know, ribbing each other and trying not to, you know, get in trouble in the middle of it. Do you know what prayer really is? It's not a language that we learn And it's not like this massive exercise. Prayer is simply communication with and dependence upon God. Prayer is just a reminder that John 15, 5 is true. That he's the vine and we're the branch. And then if we'll abide in him and he in us, our lives are going to bear much fruit. But apart from him, we can do nothing. Prayer means we bring every doubt, every fear, every concern We just bring them before the Lord, trusting that He is the source of power and life that can handle the things that we ultimately can't handle. Prayer means things are going difficult with your kid, and you don't know what to do. You turn to God first, communicating with and depending upon Him. Prayer means things are are, are not going well in your marriage, or maybe they are, and we just turn to God with those things. And so maybe for you, you have a little bit of anxiety. Prayer is turning to God and trusting Him with whatever that thing is that's making you anxious. And you just keep doing that over and over and over, even if the problem doesn't resolve itself in the next 30 seconds, right? Prayer means when you're preparing your budget with your spouse this year, asking God how He'd have you steward your finances. Prayer means when you've got the big meeting at work or the decision that has to be made, That you're just turning to God in dependence upon Him. God, would you give me wisdom and guide this decision? Because you're the vine and I'm just a branch. And I want good fruit to be born in my life. I don't look to myself. I don't try to handle it apart from you. But I walk through it with you. Prayer is merely communication with and dependence upon God. And sure, I have a devoted time of prayer every morning. As a matter of fact, lately I've been having more anxiety like more struggles with all the things that I have going on in my life. And, uh, man, my, my prayers have been more lengthy. And I just have to pour those things out to God because, I, I'm honestly, I, I've struggled to hold it all together. Like my, my life's hope, what I want to see God do in me through the years that I'm here, I want to be a godly man, a godly husband, a godly father, a godly pastor, and a godly friend. And if I don't do anything else in this life, but I can, those things, God bears that fruit in my life, man, I'm going to rejoice because God's done everything for me I could ever want. But you know, any one of those things on my own, I can't accomplish it. So as I walk throughout my day, and I've got to have the conversation with the person who, you know, is going through a difficult time, or I have to sit down with my kid who's hurting as a result of life, or try to love my spouse well. I'm constantly coming back to God. God, here's who I want to be. Here's what I believe you've called me to be. Would you work in me and through me? Because I can't do these things apart from you. So, I want to remind you. He's the vine. We're the branches. And if we abide in him and he in us, he's going to bear much fruit. How would you answer that question? What do you want to see God do in you and through you this year? I hope it's something great. I hope that you're willing to ask God for big things and dream about what God might do in and through your life. I, a couple of weeks ago, I got to speak to our student ministry. And I was going in and I was, I was going to kind of brag about my abiding, right? So I don't know if you all use version, but in, in version, uh, it'll actually track the consecutive number of days that you've been in the Word. And I was going to go brag about my streak, you know, where I've been reading the Word every single day and and I, I kind of did, uh, attempted to brag a little bit, but after it was over, a younger lady came up to me and she showed me her streak in her phone. And every single day for nearly five years, she's opened up the Word of God 
And she's been studying it and reading it and meditating on it. And I'm sure every day wasn't perfect. She didn't, didn't always knock it out of the park at living it out in her life. But day after day after day, she was in the Word of God and devoting herself to Him in prayer, abiding with Christ. And I want you to imagine if every day for the next year or five years, you were in the Word and abiding with Him in prayer, what God could do in and through you. If you remain connected to that source of power, which Jesus says, it is better for you that I go away because I'm going to send my Holy Spirit to live within you. And because of the power of the Spirit, you're you're going to do even greater things than you have seen me do. I wonder how our community could be transformed, how your family could be reshaped, how your life might be set free. You might experience the abundant life that's available in Christ Jesus. So today, I want to invite you to begin devoting daily with, with the other members of this church, giving ourselves to Jesus Christ, seeking to abide in Him as He abides in us, and asking Him to bear much fruit. Now today... We're going to celebrate a symbol. It's communion. And in communion, we're reminded that you and I were once separated from God because of our sin. There's a time where we didn't get to abide with Christ and He and us, but rather there was this dividing wall called sin. But God loved us enough that He sent His one and only Son, Jesus Christ, and He went to the cross, and He offered Himself up there on the cross. He endured in his body what we deserve, the just punishment for our sin. And his blood was shed so that ours didn't have to be. And Jesus did all of that, that we might be reconciled to God, that we might have a relationship with him, that we don't have to go pray to a priest. And we don't have to commune with God through a sacrament or some other person, but that we might boldly approach the throne of grace and have this ongoing relationship with Jesus Christ where he abides in us and us in him, that our lives might bear much fruit. Would you bow with me? Father, we thank you for Jesus. Jesus is our only hope. There's not a man or a woman here who is righteous in and of ourselves, but God, because of the life that you came and lived and the sacrifice that you made, we now have communion with, with you. We've been declared righteous. And so we just praise you for the sacrifice of your son, for the body that you offered up and the blood that you shed. Lord, I pray that we would be a people who takes full advantage of the communion that we have with you that we might abide in you as you abide in us, and that you might bear fruit through our lives and in our, our persons. God, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. He said, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Today, as we talk about communing with God, we're reminded of the body that he offered up. The body that he offered up on the cross in our place. In the same way, he also took the cup. After, saying, after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And we're reminded of the blood that he shed offering himself as an atoning sacrifice for our sins, once again, that we might have communion with the Father, that we might know him and experience the full and abundant life that's available in him. Or as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So here collectively today, we're proclaiming the gospel to one another, reminding each other of what Jesus Christ has done for us, and ultimately reminding each other of what Jesus wants to do through us, both as individuals and collectively. Now, communion isn't for everybody. If you're here today and you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, uh, we invite you just to stay where you are as we receive and celebrate this together. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, uh, whether you're a member or this church or not, we believe that you are baptized into Christ and not into this local body, and so we invite you to receive communion with us. So here's kind of how it works here. Uh, we have two options for you. Um, you can come up here and the deacons will serve you communion. They're going to take the bread and dip it in the cup and you can receive it immediately once they hand it to you. Or if you're uh, more conscious of COVID or other concerns, we have the little packets uh, with the bread and the juice back at the back. Uh, but this is a time for you to come into remembrance of what Jesus has done for you to be reminded that we can now commune with the Father of all that Jesus has done uh, through his death on the cross. And so right now, I'm going to invite you guys to come and to receive communion.